Thank you very much. I being though I can look backwards 53 years and see what we could do then, and I'm still excited by what we've been able to do over the years until now. Uh, my interest now is um, you said that you um, in this survey you were recording about eight and a half thousand channels. Yes. Um, so we know that that can be done so far. Can you uh, give an idea what would be the max the, the maximum you could do in the next near future and the the long-term potential, how many uh, stations and, and channels would you expect to recall? Uh, because of the nature of the system, there is essentially no limit, no upper limit, because each one of those is uh, it's just talking by radio to a central command um, station, and practically there is, you could have an unlimited number of uh, stations on the ground. Cost you, you know, the, the capital cost would be quite high, but it's, theoretically there is no upper limit. And we do have... Um, some oil companies talking to us that are uh, actively looking to deploy 30,000 stations, that's 90,000 channel equivalent, uh, on a survey within the next year or two. Um, and that was one of the things that when we initially <coughs> developed uh, the system with the help of BP and Apache, you know, BP wanted to go, what their vision is to go drive these very, very high station counts, 30, 50, 100,000 uh, sampling points on the ground, uh, receiver points on the ground, is what they're after, and we can do that with this. Oh, sorry, you guys, thank you. Um, uh, having dashed into the audience, so I can commit myself a question. I mean, of course, BP is motivated completely by altruism, uh, and also getting the price per square kilometre down. And it's interesting that neither you or Roger actually mentioned cost and price really. I mean to me, offshore, the most significant thing that happened in the 90s, and this is speaking as an explorer, was when PGS produced a ramform vessel and started towing 10 cables or 12 cables or whatever they could do. And it dropped the price of exploration to 3D overnight to a few thousand uh, dollars per square kilometre and enabled huge surveys to be shot in Angola and elsewhere. Uh, my question, and there is one, is what is the floor now <coughs> for onshore exploration 3D cost per square kilometre given this sort of technology? Because you just didn't have the space on the slide to mention <laughs> that it's going to be less than $10,000 a square kilometre or some such number. It's, it's actually a difficult question for, for me to answer because I, you know, I am is not one of the contractors that's using it and therefore selling their services to, to the oil companies. But I think in a similar fashion to, to Roger, um, yes, it might, the actual um, cost of shooting the seismic at, at very high densities and, uh, and getting you the, uh, the wide azimuth, uh, much more uh, better sampled wave field on a per shot basis might be higher than, than today, but look at the benefits further downstream in terms of the impact of your, uh, on your drilling campaign. For example, Durham Ranch, they would have had to have delayed things, their drilling program, until probably this time next year, if they hadn't been able to shoot that survey this year and get the results. So, um, I'm not sure what was charged here. I, 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 I put my hand up and say I, I wasn't you involved know. in the commercial aspect. But I think all of the scientific com companies and the contractors you know, would, would agree that what we're trying to do here is deliver a better image to help decisions be made in a more timely fashion. And the more expensive, perhaps the drilling decisions and drilling operations can be done in a more uh, timely fashion. Okay. Well, one final question for me and Jack, and then we must coffee. It well, is free. It's, it's not a question, it's an answer. Oh. Uh, <laughs> I eat statistics for breakfast, so uh, I'm aware of a recent land survey where it was about $5,000 a square kilometre. It was very, very cheap. Really? Um, and, that, and there's a wide range of course, 100000 We used to, we used to charge that. In, uh, we used to cost that in Colombia, for example. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I've seen these come down recently, and, and 5000 might be kind of bottom of but Ian, if you can if you can shoot exploration 3D at five thousand dollars a square kilometre, you've just changed the business of exploration onshore, basically. Yeah. But we're talking easy terrain, here, so yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Always was easy terrain. Yeah. yeah, I was trying to be flattering 
uh, just before about PGS because I saw uh, Jim McEwen and Chris Walker in the audience and it was a genuine um, impression that I had that they um, singly, single-handedly in the early 90s transformed the ability of folk like myself who were interested in exploring the Gulf of Mexico and Angola and Nigeria and the Nile Delta and so on uh, with a new breed of um, 3D seismic, a new cost of 3D seismic, <coughs> a crucial point. And I can well remember having interesting discussions with Ian Jack and, uh, and Keith Mellon and BP about why do they cost so much? Anyway, Chris Walker and uh, another guy, Mike Scott, who was also a PGS and an architect of the Ramform transformation in the early 90s, they now work together in a company called RXT, which um, is involved in the world of multi-component seabed acquisition and processing and is delivering another transformation. With that, it's my pleasure to introduce Chris, who will no doubt remember to tell us how much things cost. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, tell us you. No, it, was, it was hardly an individual effort, but that is very much down to the team. Um, uh, a couple of sort of comments uh, before I start. Um, that guy, that accountant at Shell had a lot to answer for, he's the first. And uh, quite clearly, uh, judging from Dave's comments and his introductory remarks, which I found quite interesting, he hadn't actually read the uh, talk I'm about to present before he talked about some of, or made some of his comments about EM. So I hope it will be uh, a stimulus <laughs> for, for, for discussion uh, going forward. So the original title of this uh, was Ocean Model Seismic Data, a paradigm shift for appraisal in appraisal and development. But uh, because I suddenly realized when I was putting the talk together, I did actually want to talk about EM as well as seismic. And for reasons I'll, I'll disclose towards the end of the presentation, I am actually going to widen the focus uh, beyond seismic. And uh, I remember the, the, the 99 pence or 99 pounds on seismic adage. And I, I think we're going to see a genuine shift in that in the very near future. So, right, so this is a uh, talk outline. I'm going to go through a brief introduction. And then a little bit, uh, and a lot of this uh, echoes a comment that Ian made, and I think I have a slide of Ian's uh, in the presentation, uh, duly acknowledged, uh, about why we should acquire ocean bottom data. And I'm going to basically argue that if the marine seismic industry were to be starting today, the last thing you would do would be to tow the sensor. Uh, and then talk about the new technologies and capabilities, uh, RXT uh, being among that, but not just confined to what we do. A few data examples, and then, as I say, the, uh, what I think is actually going to be uh, a real uh, jewel in the crown going forward, uh, integration with EM, and then some concluding comments, and uh, try and get some stimulus for the discussion going forward. 